Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. On September 26, 2022, a research team from Boston University published a paper in the journal Nature Communications Biology. And the paper was a study about memory. The researchers discovered that positive and negative memories actually behave differently in the brain. So here's how they <coughs> figured this out. They began by exposing mice to different events that would cause different memories. So for example, they built positive memories in the mice by giving them cheese or by giving them interactions with other mice. They also built negative memories in the mice by giving them mild electrical shocks to their feet. Well, after forming these memories, the researchers implanted a fluorescent protein into the mice, which would respond to light. Then they shined a harmless laser into the brains of the mice. And when they did a brain scan, they discovered that the different memory cell networks responded to the protein in different ways. On the scan, the positive memory cell networks would glow green, and the negative memory cell networks would glow either red or blue. So think about that for a moment. They could look at a brain scan on a screen and tell what types of memories they were looking at just by the color. This one's a positive memory. This one's a negative memory. That's pretty amazing. And they also discovered that artificially stimulating the positive memory networks, quote, permanently rewrote a negative experience, dialing down the emotional intensity of a bad memory. So in other words, the study showed something that we already know from our lives. Sometimes you experience an event and it leaves you with a negative memory. But when other people support you or cheer you on, when they stimulate those positive memories for you, sometimes it helps you feel better. Or when you're feeling down and you remember that old line to count your blessings, as in remember all the good stuff you have, right? sometimes it helps. You are stimulating those positive memories in your brain to tone down the negative ones. Or, to use a metaphor from the study, the loud volume of the negative memories does not have to be the final sound you hear. The researchers of the study are now working on figuring out how this could treat people with mental disorders or experiences like PTSD. Right? Helping people remember the positive experiences could reduce the emotional impact of the negative ones. Now, the reason I share this with all of you is because our first reading today from Jeremiah is all about memories, both the negative ones and positive ones. But before we look at the text and see all the memory stuff, we need to put it in context. All right, as I mentioned last week, you always have to keep Scripture in context. So what's the context for this? Well, Jeremiah was a prophet who lived roughly from 626 B.C. to 586 B.C. So we're talking five to six hundred years before Jesus. During that time, many of the nations in the Middle East were at war with each other. Well, then, in 597 BC, when Jeremiah was in his late 20s, King 
King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took over the southern kingdom of Judah and took some of Jerusalem's leading citizens into exile. He then appointed a new king of Judah. Ten years later, when Jeremiah is in his late 30s, that king rebelled, and Nebuchadnezzar responded by destroying Jerusalem and exiling even more people. In today's reading, Jeremiah is speaking to these people in exile. They have been taken from their homeland. They are living under foreign rule, and they're trying to make sense of what just happened to them. So in their collective mind, they have a positive memory of the promise that God made to David all those years ago. God said that somebody from David's line would always be on the throne. Well, but now they're having the negative experience of not only having a foreign king on the throne, but of also being in exile. So these people are dealing with some very traumatic experiences here. Now, in terms of major events in Jewish history, the exodus from Egypt, which is a positive memory, and the Babylonian exile, which is a negative memory, are two big ones that shape who they are. So they've celebrated God's goodness in the past, but in exile, they were wondering if God had abandoned them. They thought that God had given up on them. And I think we can relate. Right? We know that in good times, it's easy for us to celebrate God's faithfulness and provision. It feels like God's right there by our side and everything's going really well. But in the bad times, when those negative memories start to form, we wonder if God has abandoned us. We think that we are all alone and that God's promises are just empty words. Well, Jeremiah tells the people that they are in exile, not because God has abandoned them, but because they had abandoned God. They broke that original covenant that God made with them. They didn't live the way God wanted them to live. They worshipped idols and listened to the surrounding culture. Now, granted, God had given them second chances over and over again in the past. God had continued to restore this relationship. But when they experienced exile, they thought it was game over. Speaking through Jeremiah, God compared their relationship to a marriage relationship and basically said that they had cheated on God. Today, we still call that behavior being unfaithful. The unfaithfulness of the people, and especially the leadership, resulted in their being taken into exile. So in a way, you can sort of think of it like a giant version of being sent to time out when you're a kid. The people are sitting in the time out chair known as the Babylonian Empire and are wondering when it will ever end. <laughs> now, remember, as I said last week, God does not cause suffering. Either back then or today. But God does reprimand and correct, like a parent sending a kid to time out. And maybe that involves Jesus flipping over those tables in the temple. Maybe it involves those poisonous snakes biting people. Or maybe it involves some time in exile. But in all of those cases, the whole point is to bring people to repentance. 
It was to help them admit to their sin. So the people in exile were feeling the fresh, raw, negative emotions of being in that foreign land. And maybe you feel like you're in a foreign place, too. Maybe you feel like things are kind of falling apart in your life right now. Maybe you are going through such a rough time that you think God has abandoned you. Or maybe you've become so aware of your own sin. This is the season of Lent, after all that you feel completely worthless. You feel like you are curled up in a ball on that timeout chair, wondering how God could possibly love you anymore. This is where the people in exile find themselves. And this is where Jeremiah gives some good news to them. He says, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, this new covenant will not be like the former one that was written on stone. Instead, it will be written on people's hearts. In other words, God promises yet again to make the exiles into new people. God has not given up on them. In fact, God promises to forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The time out is over. In the same way, God promises to forgive your iniquity. And remember your sin no more. You can come off that time out chair because God wants to give you a hug. Right now, we, we have so many memories stored in our brains, both positive ones and negative ones. Right? Our brain scans will be all over the place with different colors. But God refuses to remember our sin. God chooses to forget. There is no memory in God's brain, so to speak, of you being a sinner. When God thinks of you, that memory does not glow red or blue for a negative one, but always green for a positive. Now, of course, God doesn't have a brain like we do, but you understand the point. God doesn't just forgive your sin. God completely forgets it. As I've said before, the only thing we do better than God is remember our sin. When Jeremiah told this good news to the people, he was trying to increase the volume on the positive memories they had of God. Right? The God who led them out of Egypt, who provided for them in the wilderness, who renewed the covenant time and time again, who never gave up on them. This God is faithful to them even now. Which means... This God is faithful to you, even now, too. Even though you might remember your sin, God doesn't remember it. God loves you. And God will continue to give you second chances over and over again. Let that promise turn up the volume of the positive memories of God in your brain. Yes, you might be going through something hard right now. 
But you know that God has seen you through hard times in the past. You know that God has provided for you. You know that God has taken care of you. There is nothing you can do that will make God stop taking care of you. No sin you commit, no trauma you face, not even death itself, for crying out loud, can make God stop loving you or providing. And yes, sometimes it helps to read those promises of God in words, like on tablets. But now God puts that promise in your heart so that you can recall it whenever you need it. It's like being in love with someone. You don't need to read it on paper or on a tablet to know. You just know it deep within you, that you love them. God has put that love in you so you remember it every day. And in the same way, God wants you to remember every day how much God loves you too. God did not abandon the people in exile. And God has not and will not abandon you either. No matter what happens in life, no matter what experiences form different memories, there is nothing that is stronger than God's love for you. Let that sink into your brain. In the name of the one who is God's faithfulness incarnate, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.